This video will contain Sigma's 12 incher size spoilers for Zero Escapes Volume 1 and 2, 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors, and Virtue's Last Reward. If you do not want to be spoiled, then go do yourself a favor and pick these games up to experience some of the greatest stories in video games before watching this video. You can also check out my video on 999 and why I believe it's the pinnacle of immersive storytelling if you'd like a refresher. And finally, a big thanks to my friend Gage, also known as Matthew the Squire, for lending his incredible voice talents for this video. If you like what you hear, then go show him some love on his Twitch channel, where he's been streaming Indivisible. The link to his Twitch and Twitter will be in the description, as are all the credits that I use in my videos. Today is April 13th, 2020. I'm sorry. I don't have any news to read. All of our station's reporters have... have passed after contracting rap- <laughs> We might be in the history God abandoned. Released in Japan on December 10th, 2009, and in the US on November 16th, 2010, Zero Escape Volume 1, Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors, a visual novel with an incredible story that subverted many tropes of the genre and video game storytelling, became a cult classic. My experience with 999 didn't come until many years later, and I recall believing it to be a solid game upon my first couple hours. That is until I got my first ending, refused to put the game down for two days straight, and was hit with the astounding realization that this was one of my favorite games of all time. To put it simply, I was blown away. Yet deep down, the ending left me longing for more. I could have filled in the blanks with my own headcanon, but I deeply wanted to see the reunion of leads Junpei and Akane, as well as the discussion about the chaotic events that she strung him through. But the problem was that 999 at its core was truly a risk when it came to American localization. An M-rated DS title in one of the most niche genres possible? Not exactly a release that screams Game of the Year. Even following the game's release, director and writer Kotaro Uchikoshi answered a plethora of fans' questions, including one that inquired whether Junpei would ever find Akane and Aoi, to which he responded, nope. They didn't. Junpei goes on to spend the rest of his life chasing after her. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. Even when I had completed 999 back in 2015, I thought that was the end of what was a self-contained story despite all the questions I was left with. However, on October 23rd, 2012, North American 3DS and Vita owners were treated to the sequel that could not have been imagined, Zero Escape Volume 2, Virtue's Last Reward. Likely the most popular and well-received entry in the series, Virtue's Last Reward built off of the foundation that its predecessor established with improved gameplay, sporting convenient navigation, and more engaging puzzles, an exponentially greater runtime, and another bizarre cast of characters with a couple familiar faces. Despite heralding all of these accolades, with how powerful of a narrative 999 presented, the burning question is, why is Virtue's Last Reward commonly recognized as the apex of the trilogy? The answer lies in the intricate, ingenious method that Virtue's Last Reward selects to structure its plot and reveal information to the player through injections of foreshadowing and flash forwards, making each plot twist feel as if it was hidden in plain sight. This title utilizes this concept on numerous occasions, and I wanted to delve into the ominous corridors of Rise 09 to detail the most awe-inspiring instances of buried treasure in Virtue's Last Reward's narrative to demonstrate why it's such a special title. For some added clarification, I'll only be looking at a few select examples of foreshadowing I found extremely important or interesting, so I won't be able to cover every instance. I'll also be examining the PS4 version found on the Nonary games, since its handheld counterparts do not differ as much as the various versions of 999. But with that said, let's shift gears and see what awaits us in the Kingdom of Zero the Third. Given the sheer size of this game, I think a little context is in order. On Christmas morning in 2028, just barely over a year since the Nonary Games incident in the Nevada desert, Sigma, a generally kind-hearted man who the player takes control of, is gassed and kidnapped by a strange cloak figure. After an undisclosed amount of time, Sigma comes to in a small room that he shares with a snarky young woman named Phi, and the two have a strange conversation before searching their makeshift prison. Once they escape the confines of the small room, the players are eventually greeted with seven other faces of various ages and sizes, which include a small child with questionable headgear named Quark, his grandpa, Temyoji, who seems to be jaded in his old age, Luna, the resident sweetheart of the group that restores my faith in humanity, Dio, yeah thanks, a large armored figure that doubles as an amnesiac named K. <laughs> ah, classic K. Am I right guys? Wait a minute, I'm K. 
Uh, yeah, so then there's Alice, who bears a striking resemblance to the woman at 999's conclusion, and is joined by Clover, the most familiar face of the group that seems to have taken a liking to the Flintstones in the past year. Initially, these two characters are likely the ones to spawn questions in 999 players, as they'd be curious as to why Clover is back, and what's the deal behind Alice. However, soon enough, players will find a large metal door adorned with the number 9, and a weird rabbit wearing Chinese attire named Zero the Third, who appears to tell everybody that they have been selected to participate in the Nonary Games, Ambidex Edition. Just like the last game, each participant will move through a series of doors in order to escape from the number 9 door, but instead of searching for that hidden gateway with a set of bracelet numbers that have a digital root equal to 9, they will vote against each other as solos or pairs in hopes of earning points that will eventually give them a total of 9. Depending on who you travel through the doors with will be your opponent in the voting round. The voting system echoes that of the Prisoner's Dilemma, a program rooted in Game Fury where two individuals can either choose to remain silent in hopes that their partner does the same, or route out their associate in hopes of earning a smaller sentence. The Ambidex game system of ally and betray occupy these respective responses and make for unbelievably tense scenarios where you must read not only your opponent, but even your own partner as the player works their way up to the number that the door beckons for. And it's on that journey to assemble 9 points that is the core of Virtue's Last Reward's story, and where all of the secrets lie hidden. But geez, there's so much more background to explain in order to understand these tease revelations, like... And don't even get me started on Sigma's. <laughs> uh, man, what was, what was I talking about again? To be perfectly honest with you, I have no idea. You kind of rattled off a lot of stuff, and I figured I'd just pretend to be listening. But hey, glad to see you're better. Yeah, I, uh, don't really know what happened, but finish the concern, Kay. Over the course of Sigma's escapades throughout their confining bunker, a strange sequence of events begin to unfold regarding his recollections as well as Phi's. During their first interaction, Phi refers to Sigma by his name, leaving him and even Phi utterly confused. And in his very opening moments is when Virtue's Last Reward affirms that your position as somebody that has played 999 will set you apart from those that haven't, with a line that clings to the player like sweat on a humid summer day. I just know it, okay? For players that had Virtue's Last Reward as their first foray into the series, I'm sure this exchange is peculiar, but perhaps not heavily considered due to its extraordinarily early introduction. Even before this conversation, Sigma is shown to be bombarded by flashes of memories, followed by the comment, Feels like my head's gonna explode. Although some of the repressed images are explained shortly as Sigma reclaims how he was kidnapped, some of these flashes like the burning crosses and rain pouring from the sky are not directly tied to his early realization. However, it's important to keep this multimodal pairing of flashbacks and text indicating a searing head pain in mind, as its repeated occurrences pave the way for an all too familiar revelation, one that connects to Phi's oddly specific knowledge. Sigma and Phi can access the morphogenetic field, a plane usable by espers to resonate with others to send consciousness and mental images across space and time. But in the building recognition for Sigma and Phi as well as the player that the morphogenetic field is an active variable in the Ambidex edition of the Nonary game, the title truly shows that divide in narrative for Zero Escape veterans and newcomers. See, Nana 9's narrative is heavily built around the reveal on morphogenetic fields and why Junpei is in the Nonary games, and its smaller more linear flowchart works especially well with these factors. This focus allows for 999 to firmly establish what are the standard machinations of the morphogenetic field as it crafts its thrilling narrative. While Virtue's Last Reward concerns itself greatly with Sigma and Phi's purpose in the new Nonary game, the reveal of the morphogenetic fields acts more as a stepping stone to crafting fascinating and mind-blowing scenarios. What's ironic is that Junpei becomes familiar with the term morphogenetic fields and what it is, however Phi and Sigma only know about the process and don't discover its true depth and meaning until the game's ending stretch. In a way, Virtue's Last Reward's structure when compared to 999 reminds you of Metal Gear Solid 2's, as it works off of a similar basis while using that to elevate the story and play with the intrinsic foundation in a metatextual fashion. Take for example the first voting round where Alice is your and Phi's opponent. Building on the subject of remarkable twists from the morphogenetic field conventions established by 999, Sigma and Phi take to the Ambidex gate to vote. Choosing Betray would be a huge backstab, but on the other hand, those three points are incredibly tempting. But at the end of the day, I'd wager voting ally is just the proper thing to do, since you don't want to build a reputation as that guy who betrayed on the first round, right? Well, you see, Kay. You done fucked up. 
Yeah, believe it or not, by some cruel prank, Alice chooses Betray, which puts Sigma and Phi down to one point, and perhaps makes the player feel a little bit less hasty in their optimistic choices. Not to mention, she claims that only an idiot would pick Ally in this scenario, as betraying was the most rational decision. In addition to delivering an early warning to the player, this moment probably frustrates them a little since they have to pick Betray to counter Alice's vote. So from there, it's time to jump back to the decision on the flowchart, appropriately pick Betray, and hopefully everything will feel as if it's going alright. Except for the fact that she picked Ally. Ignoring the sizable headache this pandemonium creates, this twist is superb because it accomplishes its goal of providing both new and old players a memorable moment and information to chew on, all while informing something fresh to those experienced with morphogenetic fields. What validates this situation even further is how these characters react to Sigma's decision and the outcome. To put it lightly, Sigma is absolutely flabbergasted. He is clueless as to why he selected Betray, as he is not fully aware of his morphogenetic connection, as is everyone else around him since they are unaware just like the newbie field users. Yo, Kay, do you have an answer for this one? Well, you got me. By all accounts, this flowchart doesn't make any sense. This voting bait and switch happens with Temyoji during the round 1 AB voting as well, which I think is great in the fact that it gives the player a surprise no matter which direction they choose at first, and it's still appalling a second time. On top of just bringing an air of originality, Alice and Temyoji's sporadic nature perfectly sets up how morphogenetic fields are not easily trifled with, and open up more possibilities than you could ever imagine. This is the notion that Virtue Slash Reward tries to make abundantly clear, since it's fundamentally rooted in Sigma and Phi being able to master their shifting abilities and get everything right in a single, consecutive stretch. There are plenty of other instances of morphogenetic fields being teased throughout the narrative, like Phi's interaction with Sigma where she realizes he hasn't learned the jump yet, and the way she knows that Dio has planted bombs in the ending, but I adore how the game decides to continually develop this revelation, even after the fact as if we are learning how the fields work just as Sigma is. In a way, it beautifully parallels the immersive nature of 999 as an ignorant player applying metatextual knowledge from failed endings to make decisions just like Junpei is for the fields. But with how much of Virtue's Last Reward seems to constructually mimic 999's design, it might not seem like there's enough to connect these two entries together aside from the appearance of Alice and Clover, as well as the concept of morphogenetic fields. And that is where the fun truly begins. Just like 999, Virtue's Last Rewards cast is filled with characters that drastically differ from one another, and have some form of quirk as they follow the archetypes as defined by the Enneagram, just like the predecessor's cast. Although personality-wise plenty of these characters might not match, their general composition is fairly similar, with Seven's large build and bad case of amnesia being a relevant plot point inspiring Kay. Oh, right you are! You know Kay, the more I think about it, I'm pretty sure we have a lot in common. There's also- A lot! In common. You get what I'm throwing down. So there's also Lotus and her Virtue Slash Reward successor, Alice, occupying the role of a uh, well-endowed character with a veiled history in computers and technology, and Dio feeling like a mix of Santa's brash, prickish behavior and a hint of Ace's undercover villain, except way more obvious. But just as I'm about to do it, this little bastard runs in and hits the betray button. What? Just look at this motherfucker slinking around like the Sneak King. If he could do is free the soul shenanigans and virus- The headline says, Radical 6 infection spreads. Cure continues to elude authorities. Radical 6? That sounds familiar, but I can't quite put my finger on it. It's probably not worth my time right now, so back on the topic of characters. Really, when it comes down to it, there is one character that feels predominantly unique, which is Temyoji, a mixture of impudence and sincerity. He's one of the most unpredictable characters, as evident through the changing of his vote as noted before, but the one consistent variable is how much of his decision making is linked with Quark. Temyoji might come off as a grumpy old man, but the player realizes that there is a heart of gold deep within him as they continue through the game and reach points like Quark's ending. That last quality is something that strangely feels nostalgic and familiar. Nevertheless, Temyoji is isn't the only character that manages to shake out the formula of virtue slash reward, as there's another, somebody that isn't even alive. 
the old woman found in the warehouse. One of Virtus Last Reward's most notable and mind-boggling features is how the story is revealed to the player in a non-linear fashion as they are completely free to choose a path to pursue, which might lead to an ending or a lock that can only be opened for finding information elsewhere in the flowchart. Even then, sometimes finishing decisions in a different order will present conversations exclusive to said order. When the player works through the center of the flowchart, they'll eventually stumble across the corpse of an elderly woman with heavy blue clothing and long silver hair. While I think coming down the middle path later and finding this woman is much more of a shocking revelation, just the concept of finding a dead body while trapped in a death game is chilling enough. Practically all of the characters express some level of astonishment, except for one, Tenmyoji. Sigma notices Tenmyoji's jarring silence when he remarks that Tenmyoji's whole body was rigid, like a rope pulled almost to its breaking point, and that his breathing was heavy, his movements slow, and eyes held back a burning force. His abnormal behavior persists throughout the path, especially when the first voting round concludes and he says, I'm old, and I'm tired. So tired to which Sigma reflects on how he carries himself with the same demeanor as before. These teases clue the player in on the existence of a relationship between the old woman and Temyoji. However, the exact circumstances aren't apparent. What gets stranger is that Temyoji pulls Clover aside, and from then on she completely trusts his word and what he wishes to do. Temyoji constantly radiates this mysterious, fickle aura with his odd behavior, which births a burgeoning curiosity in both the player and Sigma. What is the story behind Temyoji? The answer to which lies in the director's office, in the midst of one of the game's most intense rooms. During the puzzle phase, there's a sequence in the room where Sigma needs to scan a woman's face on a facial recognition device in order to progress. Temiochi places the photograph down, which successfully triggers the device and the player is able to witness the picture following the puzzle's completion. The girl in the photograph is Akane Kuroshiki. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. What's so amazing about this is that I believe depending on your path, the name Akane is never once uttered, and so it builds this sense of anticipation within 999 players as they inquire whether she's an integral player or not within the Ambidex game. Not to mention the added levels of confusion and questions this discovery bestows on the player as they try to further connect how 999 and Virtue's Last Reward are linked. What's Akane's role here? What happened to Temiyoji? Is she zero again? I remember my heart skipping a beat and feeling chills down my spine when I saw Akane's face, and even the bewildered expression that swept across my friend when I played through the game with him. It's just one of those moments that defines how special these characters are, and that they can elicit such a response, and something magical I wish I could relive. But wait, if Akane had never been referred to, then how exactly is this a secret planet early in the narrative? Well, the answer lies in Temiyoji, who is revealed to be the one and only Junpei. Although the player took on the role of Junpei in 999, he had an established character, and was somebody the player could connect to since he discovered the truth of the nonary game through the morphogenetic fields, just as we did by visiting various endings. He could be sarcastic and oblivious, but deep down, a heart of gold shined through, the very same we see in Temiyoji. When the end of 999 came around and Junpei pursued Akane with his heart ablaze, I think it could have been up to the player to imagine the results or they could have listened to Uchikoshi's answer. Regardless, Virtue's Last Reward presents the truth, and one that was wholly unexpected. Eventually in the game's final puzzle, Room Q, a hologram recording of Akane appears in the room, which marks the first interaction Temiyoji has had with Akane in any form in years. The one he was promised in exchange for his participation. I love the way Temiyoji's voice actor Dave B. Mitchell delivers his lines in this moment as it shows the shell of a man that was unable to reach the one thing he truly wanted in life and plagued with painful memories begin the crack. However, it's merely a mirror of the real woman, and a manifestation of the person Akane has become, which is denoted by most of her conversation being dedicated to educating Phi and Sigma. The weary man's acknowledgement of this reality is depressing, but I think both the player and Tenmyoji want to believe in this character we had grown so attached to before. The use of morphogenetic sorrow, one of the most melancholic pieces I've ever heard, along with the fact that the computer password was Jumpy Doll, her ring, and her final message to Junpei scream out that, in another time, their hopes and dreams could have been a reality. When she references the events of 999 and how Temiyoji rose to the occasion to save her life, as well as Sigma's thoughts on seeing the emotion that riddles Temiyoji's face, it hits like a truck. Yet she now carries the burden of an even stronger sense of duty than the Akane from 999, and this time, it's too late to revert back to the way things once were. And with her parting, the hidden secrets teasing Temyoji and Akane's presence come to a close, and he once again is just out of reach of the one person he longed to see again. But through all of these heart-wrenching moments, why? Why are Temyoji and Akane so old if the events of the second nonary game were scarcely a year ago? Oh. 
truth can be found in the location they find themselves in. And a considerable time lead. Virtue slash reward actually takes place. Oh, man, I just had the worst dream ever. There was a snail and some dude with a blonde Justin Bieber cut toting around a shotgun. Hey, Kay, you doing all right? You kind of conked out there. Yeah, I think I'm fine. Between this weird incident from earlier and this, I'm not really sure what- Radical Six. Oh, right! <laughs> the virus. The radical virus. The virus that specifically makes perception of time Radical Six. Radical Six. Wait, how did you- Never mind. Radical Six is one of the greatest components of Virtue's Last Reward's story, and something that's surprising how deep it is woven into the fabric of the narrative and character interactions. In the infirmary, a newspaper clipping can be found titled, Radical Six Infection Spreads. Cure continues to elude authorities. Sigma shows immediate shock, but Phi encourages the group to press on so any questions regarding its existence are pushed to the wayside. However, that begins to become more suspicious when Sigma and Tenmyoji stumble across Quark after a heated conversation in the infirmary. The kid appears to be locked in a trance as he pairs a blank stare with an absence of words. After finally snapping out of it and speaking at a slowed pace, Quark notes that both Tenmyoji and Sigma seem to have been talking extremely fast, but he's feeling fine now. Soon enough, the article is actually brought up later in the lounge, and Kay concludes that perhaps the mention of quarantine and the construction of Rhizome 9 resembling that of a bunker could mean that the outbreak is real, but their speculation is interrupted by an exasperated Tenmyoji demanding help for Quark, who is confirmed by Luna to have a viral infection. Radical Six. Strangely enough though, Quark wakes up with a bad attitude and is absolutely mental as he preaches about escaping his body and screaming at the top of his lungs that Sigma must let him die. The group is able to take the scalpel away from Quark and knock him out, but not without some scars left on the party and the player. They've just been presented with the true nature of Radical Six, and that it resides within the very place they're trapped. I believe this establishes further tension in the narrative as the player must now consider how to escape, as well as when and who Radical Six will strike. Although the atmosphere might seem to be lighter than 999, Radical Six introduces an uncontrolled variable that debatably makes Virtue's Last Reward's tone more horrifying. Yet Quark isn't the only person affected by Radical Six either, as it's shown to be contagious, with Alice beginning to show symptoms right before the start of the second AB game. Depending on the timeline and action, Sigma can enter the crew quarters to find her corpse punctured with a scalpel or in a trance very similar to Quark's before he stops her. The more people that show symptoms of Radical Six, the more threatening it becomes as something called Excelivir is the only cure and there is a limited amount at first. Radical Six truly becomes a personal problem following the completion of the security room puzzle, where Sigma's perception of Phi talking mimics just what Quark described earlier where everything goes by at blistering speeds before he falls unconscious. It's a successful way to show how dangerous Radical Six truly is, and that not even you are safe from its clutches, something that is fully realized later. The most drastic effect of Radical Six comes in Clover's ending, where piles of bodies lie in a bloody heap in the infirmary, which comes to a close with Sigma. In an extremely gruesome description, taking a scalpel to his throat, almost as if a chain reaction, upon laying his eyes on the victims before him. An absolute massacre. But... maybe... maybe it's better this way. Six of us are... dead. Counting myself, there are only three left. They were killed. I... I guess you could say I killed them. No, no, that's not quite right. Not just them. Not just these six. All of them. All six billion. Soon, I will have killed six billion people. But geez, there's so much more background to explain in order to understand these tease revelations, like... And the truth of Sigma's identity. Kay, I, I finally get what you're throwing down! Hell yeah! But, uh, listen here, Kay Meister. That's not my- We only got about, oh, okay. let's say, eight minutes left in this video, so, uh... Might want to try and pick up the pace. 
you know, pepper in your step, on delay, if you know what I mean. Right, uh, got it. Sigma's age is the subject of much discussion and subtle foreshadowing throughout the entirety of the game, and just like the concept of morphogenetic fields and shifting, it's made visible within the first room of the game. Following Phi and Sigma's meeting, Phi gets annoyed and refers to Sigma as Grandpa, something he questions as I think anybody would do. Yet this hint is merely left there, masqueraded by what could be considered a fairly mundane conversation, which is brilliant. Another unusual occurrence is the focus on elderly people with the poster and blue icon found on the wall. I don't think the player would likely question it too much at this point, but it's incredibly fascinating in hindsight, especially when you travel to the AB room in the past with all this acquired information. A final tidbit of noteworthy nature is the lack of a voice actor for Sigma. I'm going to talk about the original releases of 999 and Virtua Slash Reward for this, but 999 never had voice acting, and so Virtua Slash Reward was the first time it was introduced into the series, which is shown through Fi in the AB room, followed by the rest of the cast later. Sigma, however, doesn't have a voice, which is interesting except for the fact that there are plenty of other games where the main character doesn't talk. Virtual Slash Rewards' decision to play with this typical trope in video games, just like how Ushikoshi played with the foundation of visual novels in 999, is one of the biggest reasons why I respect and adore this franchise so much. Yet this creates a problem with the Nonary games, because its version of 999 gives Junpei voice acting. So for somebody jumping to Virtual Slash Reward after completing that version of 999, it makes the player increasingly more suspicious right off the bat, which is a shame. But we'll get to why this is a big deal soon. Beyond the AB room, Fi will use terminology and make references to an age difference between Sigma and her, but just like the previous occurrence, it's cleverly snuck into casual and intense dialogue without more than a passing glance. Dio also takes a shot at Sigma when he's prevented from escaping, but that's Dio, and he's an asshole, so it's hard to pay that one too much mind. Aside from these early and small touches, there are three notable moments I'd like to call attention to that further the speculation. The cut on Sigma's hand, the presence of fulfillment puzzles, and Akane's slight mention of the past in the quantum room. Starting with the cut, before Sigma votes against Alice in the second round of AB voting, he finds a delusional, Radical Six-infected Alice in the crew quarters who is about to stab herself in accordance with Sigma's vision. In the ensuing struggle to stop her, Sigma gets a cut that he doesn't dwell on until later when he notices a white discoloration from where the cut was. He's stunned because it doesn't line up with his memories as a kid, where he had been cut up plenty of times and had normal colored blood. This clue is dropped and played with the red herring of golems, robots instead of the facility, but the answer comes much later. The next instances are the presence of creepy messages displayed throughout different puzzles. Two notable times are in the bee garden and the security room, the same place that Sigma began to feel the effects of Radical Six strongly. Within the gardens is a tombstone that reads Tu Fui Ego Eris, a Latin phrase that translates to What you are, I was. What I am, you will be. Generally a very grim message to find written as an epitaph of sorts, but still quite ominous. In the security room, there's a collection of nine green screens with words displayed in a random order. You can rearrange the words to say she knows everything in reference to Akane to obtain the blue password, but ordering the words I was you, will be me presents the player with the escape password. Both of these hidden messages spread out amongst the corners of Rhizome 9 can be connected to let the player ruminate about the true meaning and if the words are directly speaking to the player. I want to point out the use of past tense verbs and implication though, as the tombstone and monitors allude to a tone of fulfillment and the utilization of was and staging a compare and contrast between the future and present. The relationship with the past is what leads into the final moment. Akane's reference to the past. Through her hologram message, the determined woman clarifies that the A and B for the project can refer to after and before, and was designed to send the consciousness of two people into the past. The idea of consciousness lines up with morphogenetic fields even if the reason is unclear, but the pertinent question is, why to the past, and how far back? Once everything has been solved with the bombs disarmed, Akane saved, and everyone alive, Sigma and everyone rush back from the surface to the bee gardens, where a treatment pod is found under the peculiar gravestone. What lies in the gravestone is the striking image of Sigma, and exactly the same face we saw hidden under K's helmet, and the real identity of the person under K's armor in this timeline is none other than Akane. Not gonna lie. Didn't see that coming. When the subject returns to who the man in the pot is, I love how nobody recognizes who he is except for Sigma, which is the final nail in the coffin to prove that the Sigma we controlled was not who we thought he was based off of the official artwork in flashbacks. The truth is, Sigma's consciousness from his 22-year-old self jumped into his 67-year-old body. The true reason why all the mirrors were scuffed up, having a voice actor would give away his true self, and the same face seen in the hologram of the director's office is the one in the water. Our face. The director was none other than Zero, and Zero is Sigma. Hold on just one flim flamin' second here. 
I thought your name was Kay. This is correct. So what does that make me? You are also Kay. So if you're Kay, and I'm Kay, what does that make him? Technically, that's you, just... Not in the armor right now, which I'm not even going to begin to ask who's actually in there right now. What is going on? You literally said we had a lot in common earlier. How do you not know? The, the point is that Kay, or Kyle Klim over there, is a clone of Sigma, but he looks just like the Sigma we envisioned we were. So in a weird way, since the player, which is me, views the world of Virtue's Last Reward for the window that is Sigma and takes on the figurative role, you are kind of me. So K equals K, strangely enough. So, there are three Ks? And with that, Kyle was created as a failsafe in case anything happened to Sigma on his path to developing the AB game and everything around it, so that the events of Virtual Slash Reward could be fulfilled. The purpose for this nonary game? To stop the spread of Radical Six in the past and the explosion of reactors that would kill off over six billion people and bring the world to ruin. Akane details how Sigma will be sent back in time 45 years only to live out the rest of his life right up until the beginning of the nonary game. As he is allowing the existence of his former self to live on by fulfilling the future events, his older consciousness will be sent back to stop the outbreak of Radical Six. Uh, don't worry, it's as confusing as it looks. As the scene wraps up, Akane directs Dio's knife towards Phi, and Sigma jumps to take the edge. Although, she didn't stab him. Sigma believed he was flung into a life-threatening situation, and we're transported to the grimmest stage of the game on a closing note. Tu fui, ego eris. Lying hidden at the beginning of the entire timeline is one of my favorite moments of the game, the end or beginning. Today is April 13th, 2029, and the world has gone to hell. The use of screams and sirens in the intro followed by a public suicide are major components in establishing the scene's tension and the bleakness of the world we've been taken to. Following Sigma's awakening, a masked figure wearing the same cloak that Snake donned in 999 appears before him to reveal that they are Akane, one bearing a familiar face but with a look of hardness and determination behind her eyes. She tells Sigma and the player of the effects Radical Six have taken on the world, and that the doomed future they are all too well versed in is a result of what happens now. All of Virtue's Last Rewards events were performed to train Sigma and Phi to use their shifting abilities and tackle the origin of Radical Six Outbreak to prevent the nightmare from becoming reality. And to paint the importance and danger of the situation, the question of Sigma's arms are answered to show that he had originally failed in the den of Radical Six. And with the stage set, sirens go off, accompanied by a massive explosion that eclipses their view, a reminder of what the future holds. This moment illustrated by looming fate along with Sigma's words of confidence might be my favorite part of Virtue Slash Reward, as it serves as the finale to every instance of foreshadowing and revelations throughout the course of Sigma's journey. And as he looks to the horizon, all doubts are cast away as he thinks back on his experiences. For the sake of six billion people, for the future, for Junpei and Akane's dreams, he will stop this.